whose Spotify playlist is this? <laughs> About 10 years ago, there was a group of people in a room somewhere preparing to tag the 1.0 release of Kubernetes. And the thing that makes Kubernetes super exciting or why give it its staying power is this extension framework. Volumes, secrets, CNI, you can even customize the runtime. But the best extension of all is the community. In another room, much smaller than that one, there was three people, me, Joseph Jacks, and Patrick Riley, and we were at another conference, and we were like, hey, Kubernetes should also have an event. And Joseph Jacks paid $5 for someone to create that logo. And he sent the email to the other two of us, he's like, what do you think? And there was all these variations of this thing, KubeCon. I was like, that sounds terrible. <laughs> but the KubeCon one stuck out with the little sailboat, and it felt like we were going in this perfect direction. And so we did this conference in San Francisco, it was the very first KubeCon. And there were about 600 people in the audience. And I asked, who's running Kubernetes in production? And all the people running Kubernetes in production raised their hand. I was like, you are the most irresponsible group of people <laughs> in the world. <laughs> it's not even one that old yet. And then you would watch that community grow and build all the things that was missing. And a lot of people are like, hey, what's next for the future? And the phrase I love the most, it's easy to predict the future when you're working on it. And half the things in the Kubernetes community come from the people sitting in the audience with you. Maybe you were not there in the beginning, but we would not be here if it wasn't for you all. This community component is super serious. GitHub is where the code lives. The conference is where the people do. And I could talk on and on about the previous 10 years, but I'm actually looking forward to what y'all do next. And to help us explore that topic, I'm gonna to welcome Joseph to the stage. Thank you all. <laughs> All right. You know, we just had this amazing year celebrating Kubernetes 10 year. Many events happened over the year, which culminated in this event. Obviously, you can see me. Uh, I'm a little tired from being in the Kubernetes community for so long. They, those CNCF photographers are good at catching on those moments, but it was a special event. Don't, don't let my what's happening there tell you it was amazing to be there, to hear the history seeing the individuals from the beginning, it was very special. But I really wanted to take this moment now to talk to two individuals where, one, I've had a long journey with. Uh, we started together in Kubernetes, I believe, 0.6, Lockie Evenson from Microsoft. And I wanted someone who also is, I think, in the forward leading edge of where we're at, Bailey Hayes from Cosmonic. And we really want to discuss, as Kelsey kind of set up, is really like a reflection a quickly back on the, what the things in the past, some of the things that we've learned from in the, around Kubernetes and the community, but then also kind of like, it's always important to retrospective and to kind of really consider the things that we could have like improved or learned from as we look to the future. So uh, with that, I just want to kind of start the conversation and really for both of you, I want to kind of ask is, you know, looking back at the last decade, what were some of those critical junctures or moments that come up to you when you look back at these last 10 years with Kubernetes and cloud native? Yeah, uh, for me, I think my journey first started uh, meeting at a uh, Docker captain uh, showing me how to build my first container. And that was this massive aha moment of, okay, so I can, I, I no longer have to say like, oh, it works on my machine, that's cool. Uh, but then I think some of the things that jumped out to me was uh, we, we constantly were rebuilding our containers. Uh, I worked as a platform engineer at the time and uh, we, we ran into this problem of 
what we were packaging included a lot of things that was not our code. And so we kind of had to institute this like required monthly update where we were just constantly churning through our containers and working together with our teams, we came up with a lot of different types of infrastructure pieces that came in uh, as part of our build pipeline, our CI CD pipeline that we were able to hit uh, a massive scale. And so it, you know, for me, it's being part of uh, and being able to come to KubeCon like this, working with lots of other people and finding many different solutions to the myriad of problems that we face. Yeah, I, I, I can identify with that journey. I mean, Lockheed, what about you? Yeah, so a couple of things come to mind. I, I mean, I have to go back to that magic moment. So for me, Kubernetes started, I was in a room with Joe, and I remember having the terminal in front of me and typing cube control create dot, dot, dot. Can anybody relate to that? When you press enter, just watching that application light up in front of me, it was magic. And thousands of ideas came into my head in that moment. I could see a cloud native future. And my journey started 10 years ago, but I don't think it's unlike anybody else's journey today where they start with the magic. It starts with a connection and a relationship to the technology. So that was milestone one. I think a couple of other things that came to mind and, and Kelsey mentioned. So when Kubernetes was open sourced, it was not done. It was far from done and it's still not done today. And I think the opportunity to build Kubernetes over the years with the community together is actually a massive milestone. So not delivering a complete shrink wrap piece of software that we could build together, I think is a hallmark of, uh, of this community and of uh, Kubernetes. Finally, I think you know, the, the creators of Kubernetes had a really good idea. They had two really good ideas. One was that Kubernetes needed a home and the creation of the CNCF where Kubernetes could grow and be nurtured into what it is today. I think that was really a fundamental decision. And finally, the community was instilled with some core values by the Bootstrap Steering Committee. And those values have been so great that they've stood the test of time. And I think that's what makes this uh, Kubernetes community so unique, is that those values, I see them every day, everywhere I'm walking throughout this community. It's just such an honor to be here 10 years later. And I think those are the things I would say are the big milestones over the last 10 years. Oh, I, could, I, I agree with you. I also remember you at the first KubeCon calling out our little network situation at that time. You were very spicy. Um, and, but Joe Beta agreed. He agreed that it was not where it needed to be at. So uh, great to look back. But now I, I want to retrospective just, just a little bit um, in regards to just the community as well as some of the projects. There's been many projects along the way. Uh, from, from, your, from both your perspectives, like, was there some things that we can kind of learn and look back at? And as we look forward, maybe some ways that we can kind of like learn from those things and see how we can make sure that cloud native really works for everyone. Yeah, I think Kubernetes does an amazing job at ab abstracting your infrastructure. Uh, I think the Node API is fantastic, Cluster API also amazing. Um, but what it's not so great at is uh, giving you a good abstraction for applications. Uh, I haven't met a developer yet that's like, yeah, let me get in here and sling some YAML because that's what I want to do to be able to write my <laughs> application. Uh, and so I think there's so many opportunities that we have for coming up with the right abstraction for our applications and finding ways to distribute that so that our developers aren't constantly turning to get those required updates out, to be able to um, just focus on the thing that they provide, the thing that provides value for their business. Uh, now, you might know that I'm uh, pretty into this technology called WebAssembly. And so, of course, my perspective is that uh, WebAssembly is going to be that next major abstraction in tech because we can now package just our business logic as our dot .wasm, that little thing that you compile to, and that's the unit of distribute. Yeah, Joe, I think it's a really uh, uh, good question, and I agree with uh, what Bailey said. A couple of points to add. I think, you know, as that vision and I set out with those thousand ideas, some of those promises haven't come to pass, even with the proliferation and growth of the cloud native ecosystem. I think as I walk the hallways and walk the expo floor and listen to sessions, a couple of things stick out to me that we still need to work on together as a community. One is security. I think we've kind of bolted security onto the end. I see it in a lot better place, but there's still a need to get better security controls and make that a priority. So I do see a lot of work in that space, excited about how that's panning out. Complexity. In building this thing over the last 10 years, we've made something really complex. And the rise of things like platform engineering and observability 2.0 I've seen, that really speaks to the need of we built this really complex platform and people are deploying their cloud native estates and workloads to this platform. 
and it's growing over time, but we want the growth of our workloads not to grow at the same rate as the complexity. So decoupling the complexity from the growth of our workloads is something we really need to pay attention to. And then finally, I think, uh, to stand the test of time is adaptability. Kubernetes, believe it or not, when it was 1.0, we didn't even have stateful workload support. We didn't even have volume support. The network providers were uh, inbuilt. Everything was in tree. Um, we've come a long way, but we still need to build a lot for Kubernetes. So the fact that it has been able to adapt to support new workloads, I think, will be critical in the future. You know, as Bailey said, to run things like even like developer platforms and WASM. So I think you know they're the things I think we need to focus on in the future. Okay. Well, I know Wait. you're going to jump in there, but I'm <laughs> going to have to be a little obnoxious here because you both hit on two things that I want. I want to hit. So Bailey, I'm going to go back to the WASM thing, and you've you've, you've heard my kind of rant about this in regards to, I feel like we over-indexed over the last few years on like this being the next container replacement. I, I don't think we're focusing in the right area. Like, I, I want to hear what you have to say about this because I feel like we've been hearing this for a lot. It's going to be the year of WASM. Here we are, 2024. So help me to contextualize this. Sure, absolutely. Well, one, it's the year of WASM. Uh, but... <laughs> But too, I mean, I just I love I love what you said about decoupling uh, and simplifying. You know, how do we remove this complexity of out of our applications? Um, just like with every epic in computing, we never got rid of what we did before, right? VMs did not go away when we introduced containers. Containers are not going to go away when we move to WASM applications. Um, with a WASM application, I think it's really important to also highlight one of its key benefits. It's interface-driven development, and you're only shipping your business logic. That's, that's the code that's in that .wasm binary and nothing else. And so to be able to run that, you have to link it with other capabilities. It's that great decoupling between what your app, app does and all of those capabilities and services that your app needs to run, which means that the complexity can move to platform engineering. It's important to highlight every technical decision. It's all about where the complexity moves to. It doesn't necessarily always go away, but it's finding the right places to keep it simple. And so if I'm building a WASM application and I'm focusing on my business logic, I know the types of services that I need. I need an application platform that knows how to give me those capabilities and those services. I'm a maintainer on CNCF WASM Cloud, and it's one of those application platforms that gives you that ability. And so by building my WASM app exactly how I, uh, I know that it needs to do, I can focus on one thing and do it well, and then my platform engineering teams are able to focus on those capabilities. How do I connect to databases? How do I uh, do messaging? And they are able to update independent of my WASM app. They can change those at runtime, continuously do those upgrades, versus with required updates, where everybody has to churn. We basically have this human build network today of rebuilding all of our applications on this regular cadence, just so that we can eliminate all of those vulnerabilities that bring, we bring along into our images. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna anxiously await. Maybe next year's my year of WASM, we'll see. Uh, but appreciate that. That's, uh, that's definitely some great context. But now I want to go to you, Lockie, because you spoke on Sunday at Cloud Native Rejects, and you kind of talked about you know, a little bit of the history of Kubernetes. And I think you raised something in that, that, that dialogue about Kubernetes 2.0. What is, and I think also Kelsey, in a podcast, he talked about what, what done is. But I, you've, you've been around this project a long time. I, I'd love to think of like, how you see this evolving as we look forward. What, what, do, you, what do you see for you this? Yeah, I think, you know, it's been a couple of times I've heard the, the words Kubernetes 2.0, and I've seen it come around and be discussed in the, uh, the ecosystem. And really, when I take a step back after the, what, you know what, we're going to do this again, and think about what people are really asking is, is there a better way that we can build this platform? Um, and what I've always seen is Kubernetes step up and adapt to the needs of the workload. So I don't know that Kubernetes 2.0 is as, as much of a thing as it is an idea around supporting new workloads. So obviously we could go back and change things, but the way things are have kind of worked for the 10 years, and I expect them to work for 10 more years. I'd love to be on stage 10 years' time. Yeah. And, uh, but I think you know, it's that idea and that adaptability that you know, it's been said by Kelsey, you know, Kubernetes is a platform for building platforms. And I think we've got all the knobs and dials on the platform today to make Kubernetes look different for whatever workload you're trying to support. And we see Kubernetes running some of the largest workloads in the world right now in just 10 years. Yep. It's crazy. Yeah, no, I, I, I think you're, you're right. I think we, we still got some work to do. I think I'll go back to the 
getting back to simplicity, but it's amazing as we've seen all these different workload types being supported. So I really appreciate both of you being here with me. I hope we can do this in maybe five, 10 years and look back and see, see where we're right. So thank you once again. Thank you, KubeCon Cognitive Community. Thank you. Thank you.